Here we're gonna look at a surprisingly nice infinite series. So this series was actually in the first letter that Ramanujan ever sent to G.H. Hardy. So what it is, it's the sum as n goes from one to infinity of the hyperbolic cotangent evaluated at n pi x plus x squared times the hyperbolic cotangent evaluated n pi over x, and all of that is divided by n cubed. So I think it's quite surprising to look at a series like this in the first place, and even so have it collapse to something pretty nice, as we'll see. So in our work, we'll use this following series expansion of the hyperbolic cotangent. It says that the hyperbolic cotangent of pi z is 1 over pi z plus 2 over pi times the sum as m goes from 1 to infinity of z over z squared plus m squared. And we'll actually derive this. So let's maybe get to it. So we're first going to start with the hyperbolic sine. And I first want to recall its definition in terms of exponential functions. And I've put a pi in there with the argument just so it matches what we're getting at over here. So in terms of exponential functions, this is e to the pi z minus e to the minus pi z over 2. That's like kind of a well-known definition for hyperbolic sine. Now I wanna make some observations, which you can very easily check, although I will not check them. And that is that this thing has zeros at z equals zero, z equals plus minus i, z equals plus minus two i, and so on and so forth. So in other words, all integer multiples of i. That's pretty easy to see because if you plug in like i in for z, then you can use Euler's formula to expand that. The cosine terms cancel and the sine terms are identically zero because you're having sine evaluated at a multiple of pi. Okay, so next what I can do is divide out by the z to maybe get rid of that zero. And that's because this is a first order pole of the hyperbolic sine. And so if I divide out by the z, then I no longer have a zero at z. Then you can just redefine kind of the value here as the limit or something like that. So we're playing a little bit fast and loose, but I think that's okay. Now we use the fact that we have all of the zeros of this function to factor it into an infinite product. So let's do that. So we've got hyperbolic sine of pi z over z can be rewritten as z plus i times z minus i, z plus 2i times z minus 2i, and so on and so forth. And like I said, that's going to be an infinite product. But now notice everything is happening in complex conjugate pairs. So that means each of these pairs multiplies together nicely. This is gonna multiply to give us z squared plus one. This guy right here is gonna multiply to give us z squared plus four. As you can guess, the next terms will multiply to give us z squared plus nine and so on and so forth. So it looks like we're getting z squared plus a perfect square. So it's not too hard to jump from this to seeing that this is gonna be the product as m goes from one to infinity of z squared plus m squared. All right, well, this is the hyperbolic sine, but we want the hyperbolic cotangent. So how can we get there? Well, let's go ahead and take the natural log of both sides and then take a derivative and we'll land right on the hyperbolic cotangent. So taking the natural log of the left-hand side, using some natural log rules, we'll get the following. So we'll have natural log of this hyperbolic sine evaluated at pi z minus the natural log of z. Again, a quotient turns into a difference when you take the log. And then over here, a product will turn into a sum when you take the log. So that's gonna give us this sum as m goes from one to infinity of the log of z squared plus m squared. Next, we'll take the derivative of both sides of this equation. So the derivative of this side will give us, so by the chain rule, it'll be pi times the hyperbolic cosine of pi z over the hyperbolic sine of pi z. So again, that's just by the chain rule. But notice hyperbolic cosine of our hyperbolic sine is exactly hyperbolic cotangent. So that means this term differentiates to pi times hyperbolic cotangent evaluated at pi times z. 
Next, well, derivative of natural log is just one over z, so I can just write one over z. And then again, using the chain rule over here, I can get that this will be two times the sum as m goes from one to infinity of z over z squared plus m squared. So taking the derivative of the log sends that argument downstairs. And then taking the derivative of z squared plus m squared gives us two times z. But now it's a quick rearrangement from this equation to our goal equation. Now we're ready to move on to our main goal. So we'll insert hyperbolic cotangent in this form into this sum, creating a double sum in some spots. So let's see what that gives us. So we're gonna have the sum as n goes from one to infinity. I'm gonna write this as one over n cubed times a bunch of stuff. So I've like factored that one over n cubed out. So I, now I need this hyperbolic cotangent of n pi x. So that means I'm substituting z with n times x. So let's see what that gives me. That gives me one over n pi x. So that's like my first term, plus two over pi times the sum as m goes from one to infinity of n times x. And then in the denominator, I'll have n squared times x squared plus m squared. Okay, so that's from my first term. Okay, so let's see what we get for our second term. So all of that is attached to an x squared. So I'll put that right there. So I've got x squared times. Now I'll substitute n over x for z. So let's see what that gives me. If I substitute n over x for z, I will have x over n times pi for this part and then plus two over pi times this sum as m goes from one to infinity of, well, let's see, I've got n over x over n squared over x squared plus m squared, like that. So next up, I can maybe take this term right here, which is outside of the inner sum, as well as this term right here, which is outside of the inner sum, and kind of put those two terms together. So notice those will ba both be attached to a one over n cubed times n, so that's pretty nice. So let's see, we've got this sum as n goes from one to infinity. I'll have a one over n to the fourth, and then I'll have one over pi times x plus x cubed over pi. So this guy is from this term, this guy is from this term. So it's kind of shaping up because we know the sum of uh, one over n to the fourth, that's gonna be a value of the Riemann zeta function, which we will recall when we get to it. Okay, let's see what we have left over. So we'll have plus two over pi. So I'll just go ahead and take this two over pi out of the whole thing. And now I'll have two double sums. So I'll have this sum as n goes from one to infinity, this sum as m goes from one to infinity of this first one. So that's gonna be n times x over n squared x squared plus m squared. So just to reiterate, that's what's happening for, with this first bit right here. Then I'll have the same kind of thing for the second one. I'll put a parenthesis so the two over pi is still hitting that. But in this case, I'll have an x squared times this. So let's multiply that through. So I'll have this sum and this sum. So this first sum is over the n values. This inner sum is over the m values. And then I have n times x over n squared over x squared plus m squared, like that. Okay, nice. So next up, I wanna notice that I can take this guy out, and then I'm just left with the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n to the fourth. Like I said, that is the Riemann zeta function evaluated at four. So I'll let you guys look up some other videos calculating the values of the Riemann zeta function. I'll just use the fact that this is pi to the fourth over 90. So this gives me pi to the fourth over 90 times one over pi x plus x cubed over pi. 
So that's how this first bit simplifies. So I think that's pretty nice. Okay, so next up, I'll try to start making these two sums look pretty similar to each other. And the way that I'll do that is start off by multiplying the numerator by x squared. That's just to clear the denominator in the denominator to make it look a little bit nicer. So let's see what that leaves me with. Maybe while I'm at it, I'll factor out this greatest common factor of x, which I have in the numerator of both of these. So that's gonna leave me with two x over pi. And then I have this double sum here where the outer sum is on n and the inner sum is on m. And then I'll have n over n squared times x squared plus m squared. And then next I'll have this sum, outer sum on n, inner sum on m of, well, let's see, this is gonna be n times x squared over n squared plus m squared times x squared, like that. And now from this point, we're gonna combine these together doing some tricky re-indexing, but we're kind of running out of room, so let's bring that to the top. So we left off at the following point. Our goal sum over here was pi to the fourth over 90 times the quantity one over pi x plus x cubed over pi. And then we have this plus 2x over pi n cubed. Last time I was not super clear about that n cubed in the denominator, but that was still there multiplying those last couple of terms. And then times the sum of these two double sums. So next up, what we will do is multiply this n cubed through and then start re-indexing. So let's bring this bit down and then do that. So we've got pi to the fourth over 90 and then one over pi x plus x cubed over pi plus two x over pi. Multiplying that one over n cubed through will leave us with the sum over n, the sum over m of one over, I'm gonna write this as n squared times the quantity n squared x squared plus m squared. So instead of multiplying the n squared through, I'm just gonna leave it like that. I think maybe that's our best course of action. Okay, so next up for the second sum, I have the sum over n and the sum over m of x over n squared times n squared plus m squared x squared. Now I'll re-index the second sum so that I can nicely combine it with this first sum. And the re-indexing that I'll do is I'll switch m with n, and then I'll change the order of summation as well. So that's gonna leave me with this term right here, looks like the sum over m, the sum over n, of x squared over m squared times n squared x squared plus m squared, like that. So we've almost got a common denominator. Notice here our denominator is n squared times this quantity, and here our denominator is m squared times this quantity. So we can build these up to having a common denominator by multiplying the numerator here by m squared if we also multiply the denominator. And then we can also multiply the numerator here by n squared if we also multiply the denominator by n squared. Okay, great. But check it out. Now when we mash these two sums together, this term right here will combine with this term right here to equal this term in the parentheses so those will cancel out, leaving us with only this n squared times n squared object in the denominator. So let's go ahead and write that down. So I'll bring this, this is pi to the fourth over 90, and then I've got one over pi x plus x cubed over pi plus two x over pi. And then this is gonna be the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n squared. And then the sum of m goes from one to infinity of one over m squared. So I did two things there. I added these two objects to cancel that thing in parentheses, but then at that point, I had two sums that could separate apart. So that's not too hard to see. But notice that each of these are exactly the Riemann zeta function evaluated 
at two. So in other words, this is zeta of two squared. But zeta of two is pi squared over six, so that makes this equal to pi to the fourth over 36. So that's what we have there. That means we can replace this product of these two sums with pi to the fourth over 36. But at this point, we can just factor out everything that looks like a pi and maybe like all of the denominators as well so that we've got something that's pretty nice. So in the end, after factoring everything out, this looks like pi cubed over 90 times x. Oh, I'll go ahead and take an x out of the denominator as well. And then I'll have x to the fourth plus 5x squared plus 1. So my x to the fourth term comes from here, my plus one term comes from here, and then my 5x squared term comes from here. So we have this like pretty heinous looking infinite sum involving the hyperbolic cotangent is really just this nice multiple of a polynomial. And that's a good place to stop.